This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with Bernie DeCoven, and we talk about playfulness, what defines a well-played game, and augmented reality. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor here, and I'm delighted today to have Bernie DeCoven. Bernie DeCoven is a founding father of play studies, creating the Games Preserve, the first center for the exploration of games and play for adults. Bernie continues to this day to explore the theory of fun and playfulness, and how it can affect every aspect of personal and interpersonal, community, and institutional health. And it's my great, great pleasure to have him with us today. So welcome, Bernie. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. So share with our listeners, first of all, what is going on in your world? You're having a rather momentous time in your life just now. Oh, well, I'm dying. (laughs) I'm sorry. I have have stage four cancer, and I've been practicing morbid humor lately. (laughs) So, you, you, you know, before we we started recording, we, we were talking about this, and 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 we were talking about playfulness and, and a lightness of spirit. How do you remain pl- having a playfulness of spirit and a lightness of spirit, and and a a, a, a a different sense, and not get bogged down in the heavy what you would think is the heaviness of your condition? I would say uh, fifty years of rigorous uh, pursuit of playfulness. It's pretty much what did it. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do because it's kind of like a mindfulness thing, you know, because you always have a choice uh, to, to, to cho- you can be playful. Uh, it's always there for you. Uh, it usually happens right before you're ready to hit somebody. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's right there. Or especially like you're dealing with a child or you're dealing with a pet. There's a great places to, to, to practice playfulness. And, and the idea is that you just kind of, you choose to to be a little bit more open, a little bit more responsive to the situation. And it's an easy choice to make once you start practicing it. And I, I really suggest to people that, you know, every time you're outside and you see a, a, you know, and you're walking with your pet, just play with it a little bit and and and, and be, be cognizant of that relationship that you're having and how you enter it into it and how the animal responds to you also to keep you into that playful relationship. Same thing with young children. So, so what happened, I mean, there's obviously like that, that great Picasso quote, you know, every child is born an artist. The secret is how to remain an artist when you grow up. And I, I was talking to a, a cartoonist friend of mine, Hugh McLeod, the other day, and he he was talking about this thing, like why why so many people, it feels like as, as adults, it, it, you know, the playfulness, I don't necessarily even know if it gets pushed down. You know, when we become adults, we go to school and you know, and go into the the world of work and families and everything. But it it just feels like it's, it's you know, you shouldn't be doing it. There's some something illicit almost about being playful. So what happens to us when as when we go through that stage where you can look at that four year old, that five year old child completely immersed in play? You know, how do we how do we end up as this unplayful lot as adults sometimes? Well. There's, there's kind of two answers that I'd like to give, and you can shut me up during either one. <laughs> so uh, uh, the first one is um, uh, I learned this from, I don't know, what do you call people who study animals in the wild? Uh, wild animal students or something like yeah, that. Like Richard, David Attenborough type people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So if you look at a, if you look at a herd of animals, because that's a social group, you'll notice that uh, in the wild, you'll notice that the the young ones are usually the ones that are involved in play, and the older ones are usually the ones that are not playing, not because they're grumpy or anything, but because they're they're worried about the survival of the herd. So they're out there looking for danger, for foraging for food, you know, doing whatever they can to protect the young. So it's a kind of a natural response to to the the existential condition of being a social being, is that we are somewhat responsible. We, we feel as we older uh, that we have, it's our responsibility. We have to get money. We have to protect our children. We have to invest wisely. All of these kinds of things are all things that make us less playful uh, because 
that, that's one reason. The other thing is, playful people are not, well, it's, it's hard to be taken seriously if you're a playful person, because, because it's kind of you're acting out the antithesis, right? So um, it's like, uh, a good example that I give is like you're going to a, just, you're walking around in a party and you're talking to people and meeting people and you, you greet somebody and you say, well, so how are you doing? And that person says, oh man, I am just great. I'm having so much fun. My life is perfect. And you say to that person, oh, that's very interesting. And you go away to somebody else. And you beat the other person and you say, so how are you doing? And that person says, oh, I have, I'm so depressed. My life is so awful. And then you say, oh, really? And then you're talking to that person for the next 20 minutes because pain and, 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 and anguish and, and misery all have greater weight uh, in our lives than, than playfulness, which is natural because playfulness is the lightening up of the soul. So is, 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 it part, is part of that because, um, you know, going into that, you mentioned going into that party and, 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 and gravitating to people that maybe have issues is because we are, we're fundamentally kind of, we, we kind of look towards solving problems in that sense. And when we think about something like, like play or playfulness and some of the games that you're, it's not necessarily about always solving a problem. That's, that's not the, the focus of it all the time. That's very correct. Absolutely. And, um, Right. It's, it, and I don't think, I think that creativity is also less about solving a problem than it is about enjoying the problem. And people who get stuck in a, in a creative act uh, have stopped enjoying what they're doing and get very fixed on solving the problem. And the more fixed you are in solving the problem, the narrower your range of alternatives. And so consequently, you get stuck uh, and then you get angry with yourself, and you get uh, violent, and you shoot a dog or something. <laughs> and and uh, it's you know the, when you you said that that the idea of of creativity not always have to be being problem based. I think that's that's quite an important one because you know so much of the literature. I mean, there's obviously great writers, people like Edward de Bono, who very, focus very much on um, creativity as uh, as a way to solve problems. That you know it's, it, that's first and foremost that that's the way that he talks about it. But then there's an it seems to be there's an entire other tribe or camp of, of, of people that say well actually like yourself you know that's not that's not just the role of, of creativity so where did you get where did you become like enthralled and enraptured by this sense of of play and what what play can be well um i would say i began with theater uh, and especially with improvisational theater and especially with improvisational theater that we didn't have an audience for that was like in theater class and I, I experienced and observed the power of playfulness for people to engage in a collaborative, creative uh, experience. Um, and that, 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 that felt like such a, a rich, freeing uh, a way of being with each other. It was so deeply satisfying for you to say something and people are listening to you and they respond to you immediately and you respond to their response. And, uh, and, you, and you create this this feeling of community, I call it later, I call it co-liberation. Um, you get into this engagement where you free each other just by virtue of how you're listening to each other and reacting to each other and supporting each other. Then later on, um, I had, an, I had a, an offer of a job where I was supposed to write a curriculum in theater for elementary school children. And that was a kind of a natural transition for me because I was interested in the kind of theater that was basically ad hoc. Basically, you make it up as you go along. And I thought that would be perfect for children. And as I, as I work with the children, none of the things that I tried really seemed to be, seemed to catch hold. I mean, they liked me. They used to call me Mr. Drama. And they had fun because it was a heck of a lot better than going to class. But at the same time, it didn't really, if I walked out of the room for one minute uh, and I came back, th the whole thing would be in disarray. So I, one day I asked them, listen, is there anything that you would like to do together? And they said, yes, we'd like to play a game. And that kind of shocked me. But I said, OK, if you really want to, then let's play a game. And, and it was a kid's game. It was, I think it was a game called uh, Duck, Duck, Goose. I, are you familiar with that game? No, I don't know that one. And it's a... Uh, Kids are sitting in or standing in a circle. There's a kid called the fox. He goes around and taps the kids on the head, goes around the outside of the circle, and he says, duck, 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 duck. 
And when he meets the kid that he wants to chase him, he says, goose. And that kid gets up and runs after the kid, the fox. And if the fox can get back to the seat before the, the goose gets back to his seat, then the fox loses. Something like that. I mean, that's, that's the basic, you know what I mean. So it's a silly game, apparently. But then the more I looked at it, eventually the kids actually invo- invited me to play. And when I actually played in it, I realized, boy, this is, there's like very deep stuff going on. It's not just, it's fun, yes, but it's like a deep fun, which actually by just accident happens to be the uh, name of my website, deepfun.com. Um, it was such deep fun that that you could feel that the kids were, were being uh, not only transformed, but playing with really important things in their life. And then when, and then when it was, as I was playing the game, I realized this, this is a, give me a minute here, because what I realized, like, I didn't want to get chosen um, because I, I'm not that big of a runner and, and I'm a, you know, I was an adult and the kids are little and they can squirt around there really fast. And um, and I realized that I was I was trying to look invisible, and and that's a, it turns out that that's a really vital social skill to to look invisible. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then later, about thirty years later, I was I was in Israel and I was talking to some survivors from the concentration camp, and one of them said, "You know, that was the only thing that kept people alive." Their ability to look to look invisible, and that man that that brought tears to my eyes. You can't believe, but but it's and the kids are just playing with that. So so I, I began to discover that even in these in these children's games, there was a theater that was as profound and meaningful, and much more fun that was going on in in uh, in these children's games. So I made my whole curriculum to be nothing but a compendium of children's games. And then came my next, am I going too fast here? Because I can't no, no, I, I, I thought this was it. That, that, you know, that sense as well, you were just talking um, there about, obviously you know, in terms of the concentration camps as well. It, it feels like, you know, as you're describing games to me and, and play in that way, it's, I, I can understand now why, because of it, if you live in a very, you know, an oral tradition, you know, way, way back before we were kind of writing and doing other, other, other things, then I, I guess like play and games are one of those things that they they cut across generations. They get passed on generation to generation to generation, and they don't have to be be written down. And and I'm thinking now, as you described that game with the children, I'm thinking of some of the games that, that I played as a kid. And I play with my own kind of family members now as well, and I think how in how did we learn that? <laughs> it's almost by osmosis. There's a, there's a whole field of study. Uh, I belong to an organization called the Association for the Study of Play, and most of them are anthropologists, and they've been studying play. It's just amazing how, how games get transmitted around the world. You'll find, like in Alaska, you'll find kids playing Cat's Cradle. Uh, you know that game with, with string, and you make yeah. loops of string. And, and you'll find it also in... Um, in Africa, the kids are playing Cat's Cradle. So how, how does that happen? Or, or the game of tag seems to be like universal. Or a game like soccer or football. You see, that's like, where is it getting transmitted from? The Z, before television and before the national sports, kids were playing these kinds of games all over the world. So, yeah, it's a fascinating study. And, and the more I studied it, the richer it became for me. When I when I was working in the in the curriculum, I wound up, with a compendium of, of, of something like a thousand different children's social games, all, all collected from these different sources, uh, with the idea being to provide teachers with a guide to how to facilitate children's games, just because I, I really understood, and it's still not a very widely shared understanding, unfortunately, but that, that when children are playing games, they're, they're practicing life. Mm. But it, it feels like so much now, in, in certainly in the education system in many many countries, certainly in in the West, you know, there's this very strong push towards STEM, science, technology, uh, you know, engineering uh, and maths, and it feels like the the play bit, the arts bit, has been kind of pushed really out of the way. Absolutely. Uh, so so you know, how are you seeing? Because obviously you you've been working with educators all the time. 
are you seeing a move back towards uh, towards play and, and putting play back in the curriculum at all, at all levels? You know, I would love to see that. And if I did, I would think that my life on earth has not been misspent. <laughs> but, but no, unfortunately, it seems to be getting worse. And it's because, you know, if you, if you read Einstein, for example, you know, just his little memoirs and his all cute little sayings, he really was a player. Mm. If you, I mean, he really talks about his whole idea of the Gedanken experiments and using his imagination. And he was, it was so clear that he was having fun. Or the physicist Richard Feynman, you yeah. read his stuff and he talks about, man, this is just so much play and, and I, I'm enjoying the, I'm just playing with this stuff and things happen and emerge. And I think every, at the heart of every discipline, whether it's, it's science or technology or engineering or math, uh, the, the, the people who do the best are the ones that approach it as something to play with. They are fat, it's they approach it from a sense of fascination and from, and they derive great joy in the kind of in the process just of thinking of a problem and letting mulling it over and absolutely and all of that. And and in fact, we had we had a guest on recently, Dr. K. H. Kim, who did a study on this and did a, a published a, a study called the Creativity Crisis, and looking uh -huh. at how creativity in in, a, in in North America has been declining since around about the early nineties. Um, yes. And she was saying, you know, interesting because her previous study had been on Nobel Peace Prize uh, winners. Um, and so she looked at, uh, sorry, Nobel Prize winners on, for science. And as she looked at those people, and you, you mentioned people like Feinstein and, and, and uh, Albert um, Einstein as well, what they were incredibly good at was they were very, very, they weren't necessarily the, the most knowledgeable people in their particular field. But what they were very, very good at was imagination play, what you were talking about, and very good at boundary crossing. Taking one idea from and uh, uh, yeah. from one area and, and applying it to another, and that does take a, a obviously it does really take a kind of playfulness of mind, willing to play with mind. concepts. Absolutely, absolutely, you got it. That's what it is. So one of the things you so you went from from there. Where did uh, you you created this thing called the Games Preserve? How how did that begin then? So the next step was uh, after I completed the curriculum was to start teaching teachers how to use the curriculum. And this is a true story, so stand by. We were playing. In fact, I had, I only had 45 minutes to my first lesson, and I had eight games to play. Uh, and I wanted to give the teachers an example of each of these kind of different social dynamics of these games so they understood how they connected to kids' social development. And as I, as I did it, I started out with the game Duck, Duck, Goose that I was just talking about. And... Uh, and we had, after about four minutes, I realized I had to stop the game because um, I had seven more games to play. And so I said, okay, well, that's, that's that for Duck, Duck, Goose. And somebody immediately stood up and said, I didn't get my turn. So, so, so I, was, I realized that even though this was a kid's game, that what, what they experienced was something that was relevant to them, that, that the same the same dynamics that the children were experiencing in this game were deep enough and profound enough to touch their very soul. They needed to play that. They wanted to explore that. It wasn't just fun. It was fun combined. It was meaningful fun for them. So that that made me realize that, that it wasn't the kids who needed permission to play. It was the adults who needed that permission. And so the idea, I saw, we bought a farm and we we... Over the years, we collected hundreds of games, and we had this beautiful barn that we that we modified so that it was impossible. You could go into that barn and, and with any stranger, and you would definitely find something you wanted to play together. And we would play, and then we would talk about the games that we played together. And in talking about the games, people started coming up with revelation after revelation about themselves, about life. It became such a beautiful experience. And, and it wasn't kind of like we were studying games per se. We were really studying growth and society and, and everything that touches us in, in, in our central core. So, did, And do you notice when, when you mentioned that, that word giving, permi uh, phrase, giving permission, permission to, 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 yeah. to be playful? So uh, 
it, it was that part when you were kind of working and training with these uh, these adults, um, maybe educators and people from business, all different backgrounds. Yeah. Um, was an early point in that just that's did you kind of do it in a, in a kind of formal way almost to kind of give them that permission you you know I <laughs> Bernie the Coven I therefore give ye permission to be able to have pl- to, to play well it was more like hey you want to play a game <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean I wasn't being I would I, I kind of absented myself from authority and I just created the invitation for them to play and uh, and you know and they felt the way I did it, they felt safe. They knew that it wasn't, they weren't going to be graded on it or tested or they weren't going to be evaluated on their performance. It was just a game. And I had hundreds of games, so they didn't like that game. There was another game. So that, that and also the whole environment. I mean, look, they were in this beautiful big barn and wherever they looked, there was another game. Everything was clues to them that, yes, this is where you're allowed to play. And then you, you also wrote a book kind of coming forward a, a little bit from there, um, uh, A Playful Path uh, as well. And I can't remember if that book was on MIT Press. I'm not sure if that was. Or, no, there was, that's, that was the second, uh, the more recent. The book that I wrote, and this was originally published in 1978, was called The Well-Played Game. And so you, and, you use this phrase a lot, a well-played game. So what is, how do you define a well-played game? Well, boy, I, I, I wish I could read it to you now, but it's a little bit too lengthy. But there's a guy named uh, Bill Russell, who was the uh, captain of the Boston Celtics. And he writes in his book, um, uh, Second Wind, Memoirs of an Opinionated Man, about an experience that he had playing a game uh, against, uh, I forgot who they were playing against, but uh, they, the, the Boston Celtics, this was a, this was a, a game for the trophy. And they were playing the game, and his team was winning by 30 points, 30 points. And it was almost the end of the game. And he said, as happy as as we were to be doing so well, we were all disappointed that the other team wasn't playing better. And that disappointment came from they were robbed of the experience of a really good game because they didn't have the competition they needed to 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 really reach into that that wellspring of of going beyond their own personal limits of like in theater of reaching a point where you felt this solidity of community this experience of co-liberation where you were sharing together and uh, each other's strengths and um, and that and and they talk about it it's a, it's a, it's a term used frequently in sports about a well played game unfortunately it's though it's used mostly the the conversation stops with the question who won mm. but for the athlete for the real player that's not really the question the question is you know did you did you really did you get to that level where you transcended the your, yourselves and each other where you did better than you thought you possibly could where you reached another level of of, of awareness and and physical excellence it's it's almost a little bit similar to the you know that Miles Davis uh, uh, quote, which I'll probably misquote now, but it was something along the lines of, "to to get better, play with people that are better than you." Uh, yes, it's this you know uh, you know in this case it's a well played tune as opposed to a, a well played game, but Absolutely. it's it's that essential thing that, that there's that transcendent nature when you do play with people who are you know, a bit further. It, it just kind of pushes you. It pushes you further, and it's th- th- there's a, there's a greater kind of depth of enjoyment from playing that game absolutely and i think that's the purpose of playing that's what you really want to know what you want to experience is that 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 other people i believe that all games are are basically cooperative and that even no matter how competitive they are the real goal of the game the real purpose of playing the game is to elevate each other so that you that you become a you become better than you thought you could be and in this in this journey that you have had uh, as as a writer as a, as one of the, the founding father of play studies, can you tell us about a time when you worked on something, you worked on a project, you gave it your heart and your soul, and it just didn't work out like you'd hoped? And more importantly, what were the lessons that you you took away from that experience? All right. Well, um, basically, as soon as you start working for some external extrinsic goal, uh, whether it's to make money. Uh, to get a promotion, 
to prove yourself as being more important or more lovable or whatever. Um, it takes away from that sense of play and freedom that is core to what I have understood as being the game experience. And as such, it leads you astray uh, into the things that are generally very negative. Uh, and you and and ultimately, there's uh, uh, it's an invitation to failure uh, because you're you're working with two conflicting sets of criteria. Um, any any good scientist or mathematician will tell you that when you're when you're playing with the problem, you have to you have to separate yourself from the from success. You have to you have to allow the play to continue until you reach that moment of feeling that you found the solution. Um, when and, and you can't do that if you're being pressured all the time to show your profit, to prove your return on investment. To every single second, you know, the board of directors is coming back at you and saying, you're not making enough money here. Why are you wasting your money? All of those things, in fact, in, 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 in companies where they have a successful creative team, they usually shelter the team from all of those external things. Unfortunately, they also tend to build up competition and rivalry within the team, and that's also becomes very destructive. So, so, and I've had many, you know, I design, I design commercial games and uh, and even in the even in the most loving environment that you would think of like in a in an educational company or or a company that was making children television programs, you would come up with against that same thing where some people who were their only perspective was on how much money was being spent or how much money was going to be made um, took apart the whole team, the whole the whole joy of of the experience, did not provide them with a with a, a a large enough sandbox and turn the walls into into barbed wire, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And in in this 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 journey that you've had, can you talk about maybe a, a key insight or, or light bulb moment in your life and your creative journey? Where ah, oh, okay, this is where I want to go with my work. This is this is the kind of message I want to get out there. This is kind of what what I want to do with with my time and with my life. Well. You know, pretty much every time I played with people and we and and we shared fun, um, I got more and more inspired because because there was something that touched my very soul in doing that. There was something uh, I, I just kept on being amazed by the beauty that that seemed to evolve from people just when you really like, as I said before, give them the opportunity and the permission to play together and how they would be transformed. You know, from, I mean, it's just a, a lot of times I did like mass play events. I used to, I, I was a member of an organization called the New Games Foundation. And we used to do these large scale events for thousands of people where there were just nothing but games. Uh, and, and all the games were focused really not on winning or losing, though some of them were competitive, but all the games were focused on just having fun. And, and what I saw in front of me was like a community being built was something, I mean, a community of people who were, and they were so gentle and accepting and inclusive with each other, and they cared about each other. And they would, and, I mean, it was like, it was like we had created utopia for the 20 minutes of that game. And, and every time that happened, my, the, my inspiration, my motivation to continue and go on just, just got stronger and stronger. And it's really been driven me through my, through my whole career, I've been doing this for over 50 years now. And it's, it seems to be interesting that there's been a move. I was at an event recently and talking to um, a, a young kid who was probably about 30, 12, 13. And I was talking to him. He was, he was very interested in maths and he was very interested in, in, in animation and design. And I was saying, so, so you know... Um, you know, are you interested in games, computer games, or other things? He said. He said yes. He said. He said actually, I'm in the process of building my own one of my own games just now, and it uh -huh. seems we're we, we're we're moving to a time now in terms of the the tools at anyone's disposal that people can actually be building their own games. And you mentioned that word kind of utopia, and you're seeing people kind of building their own worlds virtually as well. Well, building building worlds that can share with other people. Exactly. One. So, how, how does how does that relate to your work, where you're seeing now 
you know, an entire generation coming through that are building their own kind of virtual worlds, virtual environments, their own kind of virtual communities using games as a, as a vehicle in which to do that? Well, there are two things. First of all, I'm much more interested in the physical games that they create. And some people who are basically embedded in the virtual world are also beginning to create some really marvelous games that involve physical interaction. That's because I believe that the physical intimacy is a is a is a, a, a playing together physically is a driving force in creating meaningful community. Uh, yes, you can have virtual community, but it's not as rich. It's not as um, uh, you can't take it as personally uh, as you can uh, 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 when you're playing a game and out there running into each other and running amok and laughing and giggling and all of those kinds of things. The other thing. Um, I forgot. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I, and I, I'm just thinking. I, I just think that, that the physicality being an important play, part of it, and you see now kids go with um, things like augmented reality, for example, where they're at, they're yes. out and about. That you know they're, they're they're playing with each other, but then they're also pl- having these augmented things in their environment as well, That's or right. characters yes. and stuff as as well. So is is that kind of a halfway house? Do you think, or do you think it really still needs to be that sense of you know uh, s- small groups, one on one? the kind of tech, the minimum minimal of technology and just focus on the on the community well i like those games because they're so instant you know you don't need anything to play those games you can wherever you are you can play one of those games but on the other hand i've seen some really amazing games one of the one of the ones that stands out for me as an archetype is a game called johann sebastian joust <laughs> and 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 everybody has a, a move controller from the playstation Usually about eight people are playing at one time. And you're playing a game like Tag. There's music going on as well. There's, you're playing a game like Tag. But if you get tagged, the light on your, on your move controller goes out. So, so it's, this very, it's very physical, but, it's, but the technology augments the game. Also, by the way, from time to time, the music goes faster or slower. And you have to keep pace with that, with the faster. So you have to start moving in slow motion if it's going slower, or your light will go out. So it creates this, the, the computer is, is really supporting and, and modifying the play experience uh, uh, and providing an invitation to play and playful interaction. And, that, and I think that's one of the more promising evolutions. The other thing I remember, the other thing I wanted to say was that when I wrote so, so the book, The Well-Played Game, was originally published in 1978. And it kind, of, it kind of just disappeared from people's consciousness. There was, I mean, it was published by a major publisher, uh, Doubleday. And, but it just, it just didn't hold on. And also the, the movement, that, that the New Games movement that the book was associated with also faded after a while. And then with the rise of the computer industry of, of being able to write computer games and the fact that kids even could write their own, uh, something changed. And now there are departments of game studies in almost every university. And MIT Press decided to republish the well-played game 35 years after its, after its original date of publication. And it's become a textbook that's used in all of these places. Mm. So, so yeah, so that's the other thing. Times have changed. And the technology has created an invitation to play that's also lucrative. And you can't really beat that. And then in terms of your, your, your life uh, in, in, in this kind of work, this work you've been doing, did you receive any kind of key advice that, that resonates with you about what it takes to really make a well played game because you obviously craft you've been crafting your own games as well are, are there any things if someone's thinking about you know designing their own games or whether it's physical or virtual that, well, that you think is worth keeping in mind well first of all when you create when you if your goal is to create a well-played game which god bless you is a beautiful goal and i encourage you and i would love to be here to support you in that effect um when you're doing that you have you're keeping in mind that it's not just the game structure; it's the players that create the well-played game. You can maybe you can create a well-designed game, but it might not be well-played because of the of the way that the players are mismatched, or because of a lack of clarity or comprehensiveness in the rule structure of the game. 
to, to create a game that, that becomes well played, you need to create within the game in or any actually any social structure, you need to create within the game a, a, an, an invitation for people to explore, to modify the rules, to create their own rules, uh, to change the, the game, to even change the goal if necessary. And you'll see that in a lot of successful environments where the people who are playing within the, the structure are uh, invited, uh, encouraged even, to, to change the structure, uh, to find a, a way to play that's more inclusive and more supportive of the players. So, so that's, there's a way to do that, to create, even when I first started designing computer games, I made sure that there were, that there were variations available, that there were changes that you could, didn't have to play by any particular set of rules, that you could find a set of rules that was the most accommodating to the way that you and your friends wanted to play. And you'll see that in a lot of online games that provide that opportunity. Another thing that's happening is that um, most, most really successful games also spawn a community of players who communicate, maybe even virtually, just through text or chat or however they want to. And that, that community is also where uh, um, invitations to change and new modifications. Sometimes they'll even break off depending upon the nature of the game, if it provides enough uh, um, uh, technology for them, for people to make the changes, they will they will make their own modification. That happened in Second Life. And there are other games like that that you'll see that they make their own little world, Absolutely. a world that's more, more accommodating to the way they want to play. Well, that that is the that's what the secret in any kind of structure to create the possibility for uh, a community of people to take a hold of their experience and to transform it into something that is is becomes exceptional. So in is in, in that sense is evolutionary I suppose. It's definitely evolutionary. Absolutely. And and on your website you have uh, a great number of different games that you, you, you that you break down and you describe how how they work. You've got ones for larger groups, ones for smaller yeah. groups as well. What's one of your favorite, especially when, you know, um, if someone's listening to this just now and maybe they, they're, they're going in on next Monday morning, they, they're going in, they're, they're wanting to put together an activity, uh, put together a game for maybe a large group. Let's say, let's say a group of, well, not, let's say a group of 50 of their team members, whether they're employees or, or fellow teachers or whatever the, the, the context is. is. Is there a game that you love just to get people building that kind of playfulness again and getting in touch with that playfulness again. Absolutely. You'll have a, um, there are a couple of um, videos of some of the workshops that I've done on my site. And um, one of the, one of the things that I did recently, I think this was in Holland um, where I, um, I see if you can get this image here. I, there's a picture of um, what's the name of the blind uh, music, Stevie wonder. Hmm. Uh, and a child. Now, I found this photograph somewhere. And they're playing a game. It's either called Hot Hands or Slapsy, where you're standing face to face. Uh, one player has his hands uh, down and the other player has his hands up uh, on the top of the players whose hands are down. Yeah. And the player whose hands are down try to slap the hands of the person who's on top of him. You get the image? Yeah, I get it. And if you slap, if you manage to slap him, uh, then you get to stay on the bottom and continue slapping. If you miss, you move your, the, uh, and the player moves his hand and you miss, then you have to change positions. That's basically the whole game. It's a, basically a, a kid's game and it's very silly. But Stevie Wonder is blind. So how can you play that game with a blind person and a sighted person? Well, obviously, you've got to change the rules. So... So I get all 50 people, I've done it with 200 people, to get in pairs. And I have this whole list of things that you can change. Like maybe you want to play it with three people, maybe five people. Maybe you want some people to sit down and some people to stand up. Maybe you want to play it backwards. Maybe you want to play it with one hand over here and, and another hand and some, behind your back. And, and invite people just to, just to try out some different way of playing. And in the process, they, they discover the transcendent nature of the community, the play community, as opposed to the, the game structure itself. They escape from the limits of the game and create the game, make it their own game. So that's, and that, 
it always, it never fails. It always creates great laughter, great opportunity. And then if you want to actually make a lesson out of it, you can ask people, well, what did you learn from the game? Hmm. So, and what is the name? Is there a specific name that you give that game? Or is it, we obviously we'll put links here on the show notes as well so people can yeah, check out those I, videos. I, some people call it Slapsy. Some people call it Hot Hands. You can do the same thing. Don't get too serious about the game. You can do the same thing with Patty Cake. Yeah. Patty Cake or hand clapping games. You can do exactly the same thing where you ask people to, okay, you know how to play Patty Cake? Play Patty Cake for a little bit to some pretty music. And now see if you can play it with three people or five people or play it with your eyes closed. You get the same reaction. There are lots of games like that, little two-person games that you can adapt for that environment. And if, as we start to finish up here, is there any uh, kind of online resources or tools or apps that, that you love and you think really help you in the, in the work that you do? I'm constantly searching for, for more games. I, uh, so if I can, there's a, there's a little thing called uh, kidsplaybook.com, I believe. Kidsplaybook.com, where this guy, uh, again from Holland, named Jules Oosterweigel, I think, um, has gone around the world and taken videos of kids playing games in the streets and playgrounds and wherever. And that's I find that to be a, a, a great resource because you can watch them play, you can see where they have the fun, and they can inspire you for other games to play with the kids. Again, the whole physical game thing, the social game thing, is much easier to adapt because the games are so um, um, elegant in their design. And if you could recommend just one book to our listeners, and also one record, one album, what would they be? One book for what? For playing? For anything. You know, if, if you were to kind of Desert Island Discs, <laughs> if, you, if, you have that, if you have that show in the States, if there's, if, there's one, if there's one book that maybe you've gifted more often to people, it doesn't have to be about play, but just you think is, is just a, is a book you'd like people to check out, what would that book be? And likewise with a, with a record or an album. Well, there's a there's a uh, an old um, vaudeville song co- called "Are You Having Any Fun?" I have that, I, and I, I I found that track on my uh, uh, and I wrote about it on DeepFun.com, which is just a great. I mean, it's a funny thing, and I ask a deep question about, well, are you having any fun? And you know, are you having any fun? So it gets people just thinking about fun. So I definitely recommend that, and uh, playful books. There's some pretty serious books about play and some wonderful resources. Peter Gray has written some beautiful things about uh, the name. Dr. Peter Gray is a psychologist has uh, some, and an educator. Some beautiful books about how uh, people play in hunter-gatherer uh, environments. And that's because I believe that, we're, that our cultures are kind of moving towards a hunter-gatherer uh, uh, relationship, you know, where we're in small communities. They're all exchangeable. Anyhow, so that's a that's another resource, and of course my book, the well, uh, uh, playful path, which is uh, uh, actually you can download it for free if you go to playfulpath.com. I don't want to tell people no, about that's, it. That's right. And what we'll do is we'll put all these links on the show notes here as well, so people can uh-huh. can find out and and uh, check out these uh, these resources. You also find on on if you go to Deep Fun, there's a a, a link called Library, and you'll find a whole vast collection of other books that you can dip into that will i i'm sure will be inspiring for you wonderful so bernie let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you had to start from scratch so you have all the tools your trade all the the games that you know all the knowledge you've acquired but you know no one no one knows you how would you restart things i start playing a game what would be the very first game you'd play the big first game that's a good question. There's this really simple game that I that I found out. We used to play this also at New Games. We called it the Sound and the Fury. And you get people to stand in a circle. You ask them, invite them to stand in a circle. And one person makes a, 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 a kind of a motion, any kind of physical motion and any kind of noise. Uh, and, then the, and then everybody repeats what that person does. And that's basically the whole game. So I make a noise and a motion and everybody does it. Then the next person makes a noise and a motion and everybody does it. And, it, and, and this, this, this thing emerges where each person tends to free the other person because the crazier your sound and motion, no matter how crazy it is, everybody's doing it. So if you look silly, so does everybody else. 
And so you get this kind of another kind of collaboration move, movement, and it's very simple and very inviting, and hardly any rules are required to make that happen. And there's, there's one game on your site as well I'm going to tell people about just now because I love it and I'm, I'm starting to use it now as well. It's called the Greetings Game. Yeah. And uh, it's a lovely game. And I'm, I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to let people just go onto the site and check out and see see how it works as well. So, so finally, Bernie, what's the, the best way for people to learn more about your work, connect with you, uh, find out about all these different projects, other things that you've, you've done? Just go to my site, defund.com. It's very... It's very deep, and I try I, deep in terms of it's. I've had that site for a long time, so there's lots and lots of stuff. There's a contact uh, page. If you have questions, you can write me, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible to help guide you through the page, through the pages. Um, there are articles. Uh, there's compendiums of games. There are outdoor uh, other resources that are all there. So I, I would say that's definitely the other the, a good place. Or you can just download the the Playful Path. It's a nice book. It gives you lots of ways of really exploring on a deeper level the nature of playfulness in your life well bernie it's been a, an absolute pleasure speaking to you today thank you so much for taking this this time with us and uh i i, I look forward to uh pl- both kind of playing your games the ones you you mentioned in the book and also teaching them to the, the next generation so they can continue that as well thanks for coming yes. on the show you're very welcome james thanks for the opportunity hey james taylor here again And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.